ओम वसुदेव सुतम देवम कंसचाणुरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्णम वंदे जगद्गुरु Today is Sri Ramakrishna's birthday. It's a very auspicious day. Um, I was just thinking that in the Sri Ramakrishna avatar, God as mother is most dominant, is most manifest. In Vedanta, we accept all forms and all teachings about God in the different religions. But then each one of us, we practice with one what is called Ishta Devata, those who are initiated, so in a particular form. We know that all the teachings, all the form and formless, all of them are true. All of them are the same reality. But for purpose of practice, we, we have one, we focus on one. Sri Ramakrishna, his uh, Ishta Devata was Kali, was, the, was God as mother, especially in the form of Kali. So God as mother, the the sacred feminine. And I was thinking today is the International Women's Day. <laughs> uh, what a uh, fortunate coincidence, auspicious coincidence. The Gita, Sri Ramakrishna had good words to say about the Gita, which is uh, special because, as you know, Sri Ramakrishna did not uh, put much uh, emphasis on book learning, reading books. In fact, he used to make fun of that. Uh, but about the Gita, he would say, the Gita is a very good book, please read the Gita. In Bengali, he would say, Gita Purbe, Gita Khub Boi. So it's a very good book. At another place in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, we find, do you know what the Gita means? He says, if you re- repeat it fast, ten times, Gita, 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 it becomes Tagi. You know, Gita, Tagi, it becomes like that, if you recite it at a stretch. Tyagi is a sort of uh, play on the word Tyagi. Tyagi means renunciation, uh, which means giving up all worldliness. So he says that is the essence of the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita. And in fact, today we will see how it is directly related to what, what we are going to study today is directly related to what Sri Ramakrishna said. What he said was the essence of Bhagavad Gita. Um, so before I start, I was thinking we should... Pray to Sri Ramakrishna on this auspicious day that may this Gita study of the Bhagavad Gita be illumining in our lives. May the knowledge embodied here shine forth in this very life itself and may our lives be blessed. In the Bhagavad Gita, we were at, towards the end of the second chapter. If you say the most important chapters are the second and the eighteenth. But basically, the second chapter includes everything, and eighteenth is a kind of, uh, kind of comprehensive summary of everything. The second chapter, the uh, three great themes were: first is Jnana Yoga, the doctrine of the Atman. What are we? Who are we? In the Mandukya Upanishad, when we study, we see at the very beginning, everything is Brahman, and you are Brahman. So there is an ultimate reality which is manifested in all this way and that ultimate reality is you yourself. So by knowing ourselves, we know Brahman and by knowing Brahman, we know everything, we know the the reality about everything. So the doctrine of the self, Atman, what are we? And we learned that not the body, not the mind, the body is born and dies and many bodies we have had, um, the mind changes continuously. But beyond the body and mind, I am pure consciousness, existence, consciousness, bliss, sat, chit, ananda. So this is the teaching which was given. Immortal spirits we are, not the fleshly body, not the ever-changing mind. Then uh, the second great theme was, what do I do with this life? So do I have to become a monk, which uh, Arjuna said, should we have to make a radical change? When people become enthusiastic about spiritual life, the first thing they do is take out their passports and get a visa for India, back from this country. They backpack it. In India too, people make a rush for the Himalayas or something. Uh, and it doesn't end well. <laughs> 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 in some cases it ends well, but uh, the, the thing is, 
how, what do I do? That Krishna gives a remarkable piece of advice. He says, you don't have to do anything new. But you have to have a new attitude to what you are doing. Completely revolutionize your own attitude. I remember reading, it was I think, Eliot. T.S. Eliot, he says, we shall sa- sail, I've, I, I can't, I don't remember the exact language, but it's very beautiful. We shall sail forth in search of new lands, new adventure and, you know, like seeing many things and all. And when we f- finally come back to where we started and see things anew, see things with fresh eyes. We come back with the same place, same life, same people, same body and mind and same circumstances. But for the first time we begin to see. We really begin to see what this is. And what this is, is nothing other than God. So, Karma Yoga is a second great theme. How to spiritualize our everyday life. Which life? Not that you have to run up to a monastery or um, uh, the mountain tops. This very life. This life itself. That is Karma Yoga. And then finally, the third great theme of this chapter has started. Arjuna asked, suppose I get enlightened. So what will it be like? Sthita pragya, very beautiful term. Pragya means wisdom or enlightenment. Sthita means stabilized. Why stabilized? Is there an unstable wisdom? You see, realization is not unstable. But what happens is, as one advances in spiritual life, clarity dawns. One begins to get insights. And yet, there's a, that's a difficult time. Because at that time you say, I begin to understand now. There's an aha moment or a series of aha moments. But there are ups and downs also. You feel that it comes and goes. Uh, I got it, but I lost it again. That's not realization yet. No, you're not enlightened. Or if you want to feel good about yourself, not fully enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little bit enlightened. But in, in either case, it's not stabilized. <clears throat> So stabilized wisdom, so that's the, the word is very, very profound and very beautiful. Sthita pragya, forever, beyond any darkness, beyond the darkness of doubt and despair, you're forever safe when you get this. So what is it like to be fully enlightened? And Arjuna, you remember last time, he puts the question very beautifully. He basically asks four questions. If you look at the life of an enlightened person, and we are very fortunate to have the life of Sri Ramakrishna in detail. So enlightenment to the maximum in this body. So he's an avatar. But he embodies that as an example to the rest of us of what is possible. Notice there are two. Every day he had these two phases. One was is completely absorbed in, um, in samadhi. And that was something spectacular. That was in fact it's something that attracted many people. How one can be completely absorbed in God. In, in utter bliss, completely forgetful of the world, to the extent that even the heartbeat stops. And it happened so many times. And the doctors examined him. They touched his eyeball to see this reaction. No reaction. This stands like a picture to that kind of absorption. Not once in life. People get it, maybe enlightened people get it once in their life. Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Here, every day. And... At the other time, he was talking, singing, dancing, um, interacting with people, worshipping, eating, all move, going to uh, different places. So these are the two phases. And awareness of the external world and interaction with that. How does the enlightened person, how is the enlightened person in absorption, in samadhi? Question one. And when he's not in absorption, technically it is called vyutthana. Vyutthana means an arising out of. Imagine you have dived deep into a lake and then you come up from that lake. So that coming up into this world uh, is Vyutthana. So three questions about Vyutthana. How does this person, Kim Prabhasheta, how does this person speak? Kim Asita, how does he sit? Kim Vrajeta, how does he walk? Of course it's not literally about speaking, sitting and walking. There are broader questions here. Uh-huh. Um, by speaking, Arjuna wants to know, how does this person react to life? It's great when you are immersed in God, Brahman, whatever that may be. But when you are back in this world, Vyutthana, and the body is there, the mind is there, um, all the problems of the world are back apparently. 
The same people are there. The same circumstances are there. Now all your old life is back, apparently. So how would this enlightened person react to good and bad things? Pleasant and unpleasant things. How is it different from us? How would that enlightenment help him or her in, 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 day, in leading a day-to-day -day life? That's the question. How does he speak? Um... Num the, the second question, Asita means, how does this person withdraw? That means restrain oneself, control oneself. Uh, it literally means control the, se the sense organs. And walk, by walking it means, how does this person not just literally walk around, but interact with other people? Uh, how does... So the two things, sitting and walking. Sitting means withdraw from sense perceptions and uh, walking means go out into the world and do work and interact with people. How is it different from us? That is the question. Last time I mentioned the importance of this question. Not only is it about uh, the enlightened person, what are the characteristics of an enlightened person? That's the main question. But it's uh, secondarily for us, practically, there are two things which we need to take away from this discussion. It will start now from the 55th verse and go to the end of the second chapter. So there are two things we need to take away. Um, there are act actually chairs, a few chairs in the front. Those who have chairs next to them empty, can you raise your hand? So, yeah. See, there's so many chairs. Yeah. So, um, there are two things we need to take away from this, practically. If you say, good for the sthita pragya, good for the enlightened person, what good is it to me right now? Two things. One, these are practices for us. Last time I mentioned that, I will not dwell on it. Shankaracharya says, yani eva kritarthasya lakshanani, whatever are the characteristics of the perfected soul. Tani eva sadhakasya sadhanani. Those are practices for, the, for seekers, like rest of us. Yatna sadhyatva, to be practiced and so that we can attain that by an effort. Naturally, at our level, these will be practices. We are trying to do something which is not natural to us. But for the enlightened person, it flows naturally. So that's one thing. What, what, what are we to do? I'm reminded of that beautiful book, The Imitation of Christ. This is one of Swami Vivekananda's favorite books. But the name itself, notice. Nowadays, it's not, good, good, not a good idea to imitate anybody. So why should you be, um, imitate anybody? But imitation does not mean in that sense. Imitation is not that you're trying to be, become somebody else. In a Vedantic sense, that imitation of Christ is you're really trying to become what you truly are. Right now, you're living a false life. An illusion, a life of half awaking, uh, of, of dream, of sleepwalking. Awakening to true life, that is what is the meaning of, real meaning of imitation of Christ. So imitation of Christ is basically, what are the characteristics of Christ and which I can practice in my own life. That's the meaning of the book. Um, the second thing which we can take away from practically from this is often we ask the question like how will I know I'm enlightened <laughs> when do I know I'm enlightened now that's a very ambitious question but if you have that question that also will be answered here but more practically the question can be put in another form and it often is a more reasonable form and we many people ask this question what is the question how do I know I'm progressing it's usually people who have started practicing. They ask this question. After a few years, how do I know? Am I getting anywhere? Yes. Look at these. Measure yourself internally against this. But yourself. Don't go around gauging the enlightenment of a... <laughs> I actually found an enlightenment test on internet. <laughs> mm. So don't do that. So this is like a self-test for enlightenment. If you want, am, uh, am I progressing towards God-realization? Yes, this is a good way of looking at it. Now Sri Krishna begins his answer. Remember, four questions. And Sri Krishna answers them in sequence. And very beautiful, very profound verses. One of the most inspiring sections of the entire Bhagavad Gita. From now till the very end. End of the second chapter. 55th verse to 72nd verse. Please repeat after me. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Bhagavan Uvacha Prajahati Yada Kaman 
प्रजहाति यदा कामान सर्वान् पाथ मनोगतान् सर्वान् पाथ मनोगतान् आत्मन्येवात्मना तुष्ट आत्मन्येवात्मना तुष्ट स्थित प्रज्ञास्तदुच्यते स्थित प्रज्ञास्तदुच्यते when the seeker the spiritual seeker gives up all the desires em- em- embedded deep in the mind and is entirely and completely fulfilled in the atman then you will know that his wisdom is set is steady stable enlightenment is fully fully realized so what does this mean This is a very profound verse something that will stay with us till the very end of our spiritual journey when you find yourself completely free at that time you'll be free of this verse also but until that time it's a very good companion especially for advanced seekers all right <clears throat> it goes to the straight to the core of the issue let us consider this in the path of knowledge gyana yoga what is the process we all know shravana manana niridhyasana shravana means to hear these truths to study the teachings of vedanta shravana you can compare it to a mirror i don't know what i look like and then a mirror is held up to me then i see my face because i can't directly see my face i need a mirror similarly I have a vague idea of what I am some kind of awareness mind thoughts feelings emotions personality and a physical body and it's like a bundle which is continuously changing and probably doomed to death and destruction this is our vague idea when we have not examined it without examining it this is what we think about ourselves i'm this person right but when we examine ourselves the very definition of philosophy well, who was it socrates or plato the unexamined life is not worth living unexamined life is not worth living yeah to which the french always contrary sartre he replied um, to to 2000 more than 2000 years later he replied the unlived life is not worth examining <laughs> <laughs> which is also profound if you think about it <laughs> when we examine our ourselves the vedanta this these texts upanishads gita they are like the mirror they show us as we truly are not as we thought ourselves to be they show us it's not like a physical mirror of course as we read this and listen to it and think about it and match it i was reading swami turiyananda's his reminiscences and he is talking about vedanta to a young monk and he says one interesting thing vedanta one unless you match it to your own life when you are studying it it's not of much use so keep matching it to your own life so when we study the texts aparoksha anubhuti drig drishya viveka bhagavad gita upanishads they all say one thing that's the advantage of vedanta there's only one thing they're saying i think today in the morning somebody was saying oh i don't have so much knowledge so much to learn no there's not so much to learn vedanta is just telling you just one thing what you are all the rest is just by the way of taking you along the way So this one thing is shown to us by by shravanam hearing literally it means hearing because in those days it was chanted and explained they were not the books were not used as such so we use hear these truths study them and this stage is over when you can say all right this is what the texts tell me i am i am this consciousness pure being spirit but now we are assailed by doubt we have questions how can i be consciousness i know there's some kind of awareness here but i am awareness plus mind plus body plus all these thoughts i am this person so all these questions come to us and all these questions must be ra- raised and discussed and argued out threadbare <coughs> until we get clarity until all questions are set at rest until you know the answer to it intellectually yes intellectually definitely 
That is another distinguishing characteristic of Vedanta. It does not dispense with the intellect. It does not say leave your intellect like you know, like your boots outside. You leave, leave it. Um, by the way, you don't have to leave your boots outside here. It's allowed. Uh, so, um, intellect you must bring in with you. Don't check it out there. <laughs> Vedanta will not work if you leave your intellect out. Swami Vivekananda said that um, a man must not only have faith but must have intellectual faith too. Your intellect must assent, must give a check to the to the your belief system. If they are at if they are at odds with each other, especially in the modern modern age, you can't uh, really progress in spiritual life if your intellect says no smart person believes these things. <clears throat> so intellect must be given full play whatever question you have ask fearlessly think fearlessly don't don't just ask think and try to get the answer for yourself and asking and studying you will get the answer that is the phase of mananam then after that what happens i've got clarity i know the teaching i've got clarity shravan and manan are over now the interesting thing is nididhyasan this is what is talked about in this verse one must immerse oneself stay with that clarity for a while that i know what it is i have understood it very good stay there stay there why why stay there see at, at this stage the problem is we have ingrained patterns of behavior thought patterns speech patterns the reaction patterns somebody told me a psychologist that a counselor actually if you watch couples quarreling they repeat the same quarrels they don't have they're not as creative as one would think that they have a quarrel separate quarrel every day basically it's the same quarrel they repeat but it's not just couples quarreling it could be relationships any other relationship in the school in the office it could be our own internal speech the usually we are not all that creative <laughs> we are, we repeat and recycle endlessly so tendencies are there thought patterns behavior patterns which are now at complete odds to what you have learned what we have learned and got clarity about is very different from what our old patterns of behavior are what is the old pattern of behavior i am this little person this body mind subject to sickness death uh, desire frustration this is who i am and i'm struggling to make a life for myself and i'm a tiny person very soon the universe will crush me out of existence and that's it maybe god exists maybe doesn't so this is my idea and all my behavior was based on that a part human part animalistic behavior now all that has to be replaced will not your reading and clarity replace it no usually not if the preparation remember vedanta requires sadhan chatushtha the fourfold qualifications if you are really a qualified seeker at this stage the clarity will lead to full realization sthita pragya that clarity itself that clarity is called pragya wisdom that wisdom will deepen into realization if the mind is prepared if the mind is not prepared i'll say i have understood it but i can't do it in life it's not reflected in life if somebody is honest and there are dishonest uh, uh, philosophers too agnanis there is a, a why this phase is necessary one one sadhu in uttarakhand said in hindi i'll translate rota hua agnani kisi ko pasand nahi a crying gyani is a very is a very unattractive proposition who is a crying gyani so i am the atman but my body and mind don't obey me yes you are an enlightened person how is it that you are greedy oh, greed is in the mind you see i am the witness then you're eating so many sweets and so many there is just uh, no control over your eating i'm witnessing body and mind are doing their own thing <laughs> now you may laugh but that's what they say some some i have seen it angry hot tempered so i asked the, the swami about it and he dismissed it oh that's only in the mind <laughs> in a sense right but in a sense very fatally mistaken all the upanishads gita and all of them all the masters they say this realization must be actualized in fact the words they use is <coughs> knowledge must be actualized into realization the swami vivekananda picked the word god realization realization you see his famous definition of religion um each soul is potentially divine 
the goal is to manifest this divinity uh, within by do it by meditation by work by service by knowledge whatever of combination of all of them and be free that is the whole of religion books temples doctrines churches are secondary details so on but it struck me why the manifestation of the divinity within he that's the phrase he uses why not if you read vedanta you will get the feeling knowledge of the divinity within i must know that i am the atman that's it vivekananda says no 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 it must be manifested in thought in speech in deed it must prove its worth in day to day life does it protect me does it truly promise does it fulfill its promise to take me beyond suffering all the little sufferings of life do they now no longer matter to me anymore because i have got this or all those are there plus one more vedantic suffering is there <laughs> so how to convert this knowledge into realization how to stabilize this knowledge deepen it into realization pragya into sthita pragya that is that that happens at this stage nididhyasana where you stabilize yourself in this knowledge this stabilization is jivan mukti the other word used in vedanta traditionally jivan mukti liberated while living is still in the body mind living in this world but entirely liberated so what happens um the key word here is atmanyeva atmana tushtah completely how do they translate it delights in in his own self completely satisfied in the atman once i find this right now we don't even know what it is atman means the self right now if i ask what is the self i'll say this this is not the real self through vedantic inquiry when we come upon the real self gain clarity in it stabilize yourself in in it then do i need anything else is there anything that the world can offer me no i realize that satisfaction i'd been searching for that is there in the self alone to tushta satisfied contented happy delighted happiness you see i was reading eric from the great psychoanalyst now there's not many people uh, read um but in one place he says happiness in our modern society is build up building up of tension and releasing it you create tension create a desire by advertisement or whatever society teaches you advertisement parents condition you so a desire is generated and then you try to satisfy it when you satisfy the tension is released and you call it happiness so building up a pressure a tension inside and releasing it that is happiness then again how to get happiness build it up again and then release it so that that kind of happiness obviously is surrounded by suffering dukkha unhappiness it is temporary it is uh, takes a lot of effort to generate and sustain and and get that happiness how many people get that and how can you sustain it and it's it is habit forming that in the sense all kinds of sense pleasures once you have it that is not enough to give you the second uh, give you the same happiness the law of diminishing marginal utility in economics we read every little bit of uh, consumption gives you less and less and less happiness so you must step up step it up more more variety more of that it sounds like a drug addiction it is like a drug addiction so that happiness that's the happiness of the world and the upanishad say taitiriya upanishad is a classic uh, there is a section called ananda mimamsa the calculus of happiness the calculus of happiness it says all our so called human happiness is actually a reflection of the bliss within we have the infinite bliss within we are that and a little bit is reflected outside and we think it's there trying to grab it why because we are not aware of what is inside not aware of in what is inside we try to reflect it in the world and catch hold of it not knowing that the all of it not just one drop the entire ocean is within shankaracharya in his commentary says beautifully the ocean of bliss is within just the mere spray of which you know an ocean when there's a wave there's spray mere spray of which 
all human beings are madly running after. The spray of which is the little bit of happiness you find in the world. It's a reflection of the infinite happiness within. In the Taittiriya Upanishad, um, that calculus of happiness, there's a beautiful description. It says, how do we get this happiness in the world? Vishaya Indriya Sanyoga. Pleasure is the connection of your senses with the desired object. It could be an object, it could be a person, could be an experience, could be a place, could be a food, anything. Whatever is desired, that should come into contact with my senses. I should see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, touch it. Or think it. A mathematician is not getting sense pleasure, but intellectual pleasure, thinking about it. I heard... Somebody told me that a musician here, you see, they said after a certain amount of training in classical music, you look at the score and you can actually hear the music internally. You don't have to actually play it out. You can, in a very subtle sense, you can hear it internally. Who was the great composer who went deaf? Beethoven. Beethoven. And composing extraordinary music. He could entirely hear it internally. And Vedanta says how that is possible. Anyhow. So, but the basic idea is by connection of of something external, I will get pleasure. Not true. All that pleasure is coming from within. But let us assume that is the way to get happiness. So how do you get happiness? Vedanta says there are three things which are necessary. Object, desired object. And a body-mind complex. And an environment is necessary. Environment is important. The same um, cup of tea if you um, take, or cup of coffee you take uh, on a cart outside uh, or in the Regency Hotel, the difference is good. (laughs) Same cup of tea. (laughs) And they'll charge you also five times more for that. But the reason is, why are they charging? Loka, the environment. (laughs) It's called environment. So three things are necessary. Object, in Sanskrit, vishaya. Body-mind complex. In Sanskrit, Sharira. And environment. Sanskrit, Loka. Literally means world. And then the Upanishad goes on a calculus. It takes you on a journey of... It's, it's an excellent uh, uh, passage in the Taittiriya Upanishad. Second chapter. I've given a talk on it. In, I think in quest of happiness, in search of happiness, something like that. So, basically what it says is, imagine the maximum possible happiness in this world. And it gives you, a, first qualification itself is, uh, is a disappointing. How, how can you be happy? The first is, you are Syati, you must be young. I remember the first time I said this in Trabuco, people booed from the, and the older people booed. They went boo. <laughs> but it's true. Uh, youth, what is naturally present in youth, later on in, um, after you are 40, 50, 60, it takes a lot of effort and manage, uh, to manage it and to keep it even anywhere close to that level. Whereas when you are 21, you don't need anything like that. Um, a German general in the Second World War, in, uh, he writes, you know, he is commanding armies and something and he, he became sick. He writes in his diary, Now I know how Alexander the Great conquered half the world. He was 21. <laughs> 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 to be a general, you must be pretty old, 50s or something like that. So youth, educated, moral, a good person, highly qualified person, strong, young, and strong, physically strong. It says physically, ashishta, dradishta, balishta, vigorous, strong, physically strong, young. And, prithivitasya vittasya purnasyat, all the wealth of the world is at his command, this person's command. That is extraordinarily rich. What is it called? Trust fund. Trust fund baby, yes. So a multimillionaire or billionaire from birth. With all of this, imagine, if you have all of this, this is, he says, one, the Upanishad says, this is one unit of happiness. Consider this as one. Start here. How many people get this kind of happiness at any period of human history? At any period of human history, maybe a few, a handful of people might be getting this kind of of a situation. And then he goes on. There are other worlds with more happiness. And he talks about Gandharva Loka, other many, many. There's, there's a whole category of different kinds of what might be called heavens, where you get extraordinarily beautiful and powerful bodies. You get divine uh, 
uh, objects which are not available here of enjoyment and a heavenly atmosphere and so enjoyment is increased he says in the in the lowest heaven possible uh, you um, get a hundred times the happiness of this richest happiest human being lowest heaven and then the next heaven you get a hundred times of that and the next heaven you get a hundred times of that and in the highest heaven there are many many categories of the worlds and in the highest one i calculated i sat down and calculated 10 to the power 2 10 to the power 2 like that you yeah. <laughs> it came to 10 to the power 20 one followed by 20 zeros of what of the happiest possible human being you can imagine what is that the power lottery or something they call power ball my god they talk about what they winning 100 million dollars 300 million i don't know if they actually people get that much money anyhow imagine that person if that person gets one unit of happiness you can get tens of thousands of units more in higher heavens but at the end the upanishad says all of that 10 to the power 20 is present within you right now is it 10 to the power 20 and infinitely more infinitely more is present within you right now and he says all this happiness is just a reflection of your inner happiness depending upon the quality of the reflector you're getting better and better reflections depending on the mirror you see your face in in dirty water in clear water in glass in a titanium mirror you get better and better reflections of your face similarly better body better objects better local world environment more your happiness is reflected but what is being reflected is is exactly the same thing reflections are better or worse so the the happiness that we enjoy in the world is more or less but it's all what you are it's infinitely there within within us and that is what vedanta gives us access to right now we have it but we don't have access to the trust fund <laughs> we don't know how to get hold of it it's there vedanta is the lock is the key which opens that vault so atmanevatmana atushta once one finds that then one does not have to go around with a begging bowl to beg from the world give me little happiness give me little happiness give me little happiness it's my happiness <laughs> of course I, I, all of it is mine and here is a subtle thing people misunderstand you see take the example of the mirror you will understand you use the mirror to look at your face but when you are not looking at your face are you worried is the face there or not <laughs> and are you worried as long as i look in the mirror it's all right when you go away oh my god it's gone it's not gone we never think that you have to keep staring at the mirror that's crazy here it is thing the enlightened person does not feel that the inner joy ananda has to be constantly reflected in the mind why i'm saying ananda here is something to understand ananda this inner joy the, the the real bliss of the self it is not an experience this is where people get dis- disappointed oh i can't experience it <laughs> oh what's the point no 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 it is that which you are experiencing all the time in fractions in reflections it is all of it is you but in itself it's not an experience and it's good that it's not an experience think about it an experience comes and goes an experience is subject to increase and decrease degrees an experience is better or worse an experience is a reflection of the reality the reality the beautiful saying bradley who was a great british philosopher in 19 early 20th century he said what appears is not real reality never appears <laughs> why does reality never appear because it's you so ananda is not a felt experience its reflection is felt exactly like sat chit ananda existence consciousness bliss sat is not a thing which exists it is existence itself it's absolute existence chit consciousness is not a conscious experience it is consciousness itself which makes all experience is possible ananda is not a particular kind of bliss it is that 
on which all pleasure and bliss and happiness and satisfaction are based. The existence of the universe, of all things in the universe depends on Sat. But Sat is not a thing. It is the existence of all things but it's not a thing in itself. Chit is not a particular conscious experience but it makes all conscious experience possible. Ananda is not a particular uh, feeling of pleasure but it makes all joy and uh, bliss possible. So this is what. That's why many people say you have talked about pure being existence. You've talked about consciousness. Why don't you talk about ananda, bliss? People misunderstand. They think that is a new kind of delight to uh, savor. No. It's something much more. So having realized that, Atmanyevatmanatushta, completely satisfied by the infinite joy, why would he not be satisfied? What is, what is there beyond it to gain? It's completely, it's fulfilled. Tushta is fulfilled, contented. If there's a niggling doubt in your mind, yes, but after that, would the enlightened person be happy or not? Are you saying he'll now no longer be happy? He'll be very happy. He or she will be very happy if you just look at this, the lives of the saints. They are one distinguishing characteristic. They are so different from each other. But one common characteristic is they are always happy. Not a smiley face happiness. In every saint's life, you will find a deep peace, contentment, tranquility. They may be overwhelmed by a desire for God or they feel the absence of God and they have storms in their life, but they're spiritual storms. They're not worried about any kind of worldly happiness or unhappiness. So, yes, the enlightened person is, is actually happy in the sense we understand happiness in that sense also. And far more and in a far more stable sense than we can ever imagine. And that happiness is not dependent on money, on success, on fame, on any person, on uh, whether how people treat them, on physical health, on whether they are lonely or um, another thing. They're never lonely. In mountain caves, not at all lonely. And people are lonely here in Manhattan. They may be alone, but not lonely. Never. So that kind of uh, delight is there. So the enlightened person is always happy. So that's there. What will be the result of this? The result will be what, what the verse started with. Prajahati yada kaman. The result of this delight should be the renunciation or the giving up of all desires, the vasanas, the tendencies to enjoy objects, things of the world, that will be given up. Why? The little bits of pleasure I was searching for in this world through those things. I have got the infinity of it inside. Why should I do that anymore? So the, the one who said that, oh I am greedy, it's something in the mind, uh, but I am the witness there, that realization is not there. It, or at least it's not uh, deep enough. The mind might have got an inkling of it, a flash of it. If it's deep enough, all kinds of cravings, all kinds of this idea that something in the world outside will make me happy. Yes, if you still eat a cookie, you'll be happy. Mm -hmm. There is nothing wrong in that. But they will no longer think that my happiness depends on the world. If people behave in this way, I will be happy. If not, I'm terribly unhappy. If I get this job, I'll be happy. If my health is okay, I'll be happy. If I have a medical problem, I'll be unhappy. No. Whatever the condition of the world, of the people, of their behavior, of my finances, of my health, that inner happiness never fades. Yeah. So, individual desires, trying to get fulfillment from sense pleasures, from money, from people, from um, one's own achievements, those things fade away. But remember, a person still may have a desire for enjoying the bliss of bhakti of God. Enjoying helping others. Often many great spiritual enlightened people, they live the rest of their life as, a, as an offering, as a service. They, this lifting of desire, Sri Ramakrishna, all the great teachers, Krishna here, Buddha, Sri Ramakrishna, all of them 
they they say this is like a veil of darkness which must be lifted this craving for sense pleasures in the world now for many people it's terrible you know why it's terrible because this is the only source of happiness and we think if i give this up how will i be happy in fact in his commentary to this verse shankaracharya writes if one gives up seeking pleasures in the world then what will be the source of pleasure for that enlightened person unmattasya va prasanga he'll go mad become like a rock like a um, un, uh, unreacting wall or something no the answer is not at all that person has an infinite source of joy infinite source of bliss does not require now so prajahati yada kama now somebody asks Okay, I may have the infinite source of joy within, and I can retain a few, just a few uh, external things. What's the harm? I've got the infinite and a little bit outside, <laughs> on the side, <laughs> on the side, yeah. toppings. You know, there are toppings, extras. He says, "No, sarvan, all of it has to be given up." Why? Even the desire to retain a little bit comes from ignorance. somewhere there's a hidden thing that um yeah it sounds good this thing but just for to be sure i'll keep a few worldly pleasures uh, around then you have not really realized what is this this should become an overwhelming reality yeah i know the sun is shining brightly blazing forth illumining the earth i'll still keep my flashlight on in case it goes out you know <laughs> what's the harm the sunlight plus my flashlight is better right No, you have not understood what sunlight is. <laughs> you have only seen the flashlight. You think it's a, like a bigger flashlight, maybe? No, 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 not at all. So, sarvan, all of it must be given up, because it it shows uh, um, a seed of um, ignorance there. It will make you unhappy afterwards. Swami Premananda. in the in the in the main monastery in belur when the young novices were being trained so they were being asked to pull out um this weeds and uh, it's hard work pulling it out, out of dry ground so one novice got a bright idea he took a sickle and started cutting it off the weeds so it's fast work and premanand saw that and he scolded him root and branch my boy root and branch pull it out root and branch this is that kind of work is no good it will pop up tomorrow again or day after tomorrow when it rains it will come back again what does he mean is he talking about the weeds no no they all the teaching was about spiritual life i remember once i was in the temple of belur math where sri ramakrishna's image is there um and any number of senior monks would have been furious at that wording what do you mean sri ramakrishna's image <laughs> sri ramakrishna is there um i was there's a little annex behind it where preparations for the worship are done there are monks worship, working there so i was a novice i was one day sitting uh, these um, brass flower vases are there and they have to be polished otherwise they lose their shine so i was sitting and polishing one and uh, a monk a uh, uh, senior monk he he passed by that and looked at me and he said brahmachari novice what are you doing I said, "Polishing, Swami, I'm polishing the vase." He said, "No, you're polishing your mind." And so these little things I always remember. That's the point of it. You're not polishing a, a flower. What's the What's the point of polishing a flower vase? We We can hire somebody else to do it. Why are we using a monk to do it? It's using that work for that internal uh, purification. You're polishing your mind. By the way, funny things happen in India. It's considered a religious thing when you go to temple to give money. So you think something holy or religious going around? People, especially devout women from villages, they will throw money at you. <laughs> I learned not to sit near the door because those devout women will be going around, around like this, and they would see a, a young a novice working somewhere, doing something vaguely holy. So they'll throw coins. <laughs> uh, once uh, a monk, he saw <laughs> some people had thrown the money, so I just put it, put it aside. thinking i'll put it in the arms box later on and the monk was passing by he said well 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 collecting money here too <laughs> <laughs> yeah prajahati yada kaman 
Now there are two words here in Sanskrit. Yada tada. Very interesting. Yada means when. Tada means then. Yada means if. If, when, then. When all prajahati yada kaman. When all the desires of the mind are given up. Stita pragya staduchyate. Then you are called an uh, uh, enlightened person with steady wisdom. You are fully enlightened then. So that won't work. The desire is only in the mind. I am um, uh, enlightened. I am the Atman. I know that. No, the Gita clearly says, even in the mind, that desire also has to be given up, Swami. <laughs> Those desires are, are cleared out when the mind is purified. It's literally like a veil rising from your eye. All the spiritual things which we are struggling to get at, they immediately become clear. Yada tada. In the 53rd verse, we have done it already. I'll just repeat it to you. These words come. Shruti vipratipannate yada stasyati nishchala samadho vachala buddhi tada yogam avapsyasi he says, when your mind is no longer disturbed, is, is, is steady, no longer disturbed by worldly desires, then it becomes steady in samadhi. Two words are used in Sanskrit, nishchala, which means not moving. Achala, it also means not moving. Not moved by worldly desires, not flickering because of worldly desires. Then steady in Atman. If you people ask this question, when will my enlightenment, my knowledge be steady? When these, when your mind is not disturbed, when it doesn't flicker because of worldly desires, worldly temptations, anxieties, fears, perturbed, you know, anger, greed, hatred, lust. When it, when my mind is not flickered, does not flicker because of this, nishchala, not flickering. Then enlightenment, achala, you are, you are fully established in the self. If, then, when, then. You might think, when will it be fully established? Um, when I have attended, uh, completed the Bhagavad Gita course? No. Not when I have read so many books? No. When I have completed meditation? No. When I have a lot of devotion to God? No. No. When these desires are gone from the mind. All of those things are important. Jnana is important. Yoga is important. Bhakti is important. Karma Yoga is important. And they all do what? Polish the mirror. Polish the vas. When these desires are gone. Then. Your enlightenment is steady. Straight. This is the connection. So then, then let's just do that. So that's a little difficult. If you can do that instantaneously, let Swami Vivekananda says, Thine only is the hand that holds the rope that drags thee on. Song of Sanyasi. Then what's the solution? Let go thy hold, Sanyasi bold. Say Om Tat Sat Om. It doesn't mean you give up the activities in the world. Arjuna is asked to go on for performing his duties. But now as a spiritual practice, as Karma Yoga. Earlier, what, what are the activities? Why were we doing these activities? By these activities, I will get happiness. Satisfaction, fulfillment. No. No, Swami, I won't. That's very disappointing. Who has got happiness for, through these permanent, lasting peace, through these till now, in the entire history of human civilization? Which person? Which billionaire? Which emperor? Which general? Which bodybuilder, which most beautiful uh, person, neither beauty, nor strength, nor money, nor riches, nor knowledge, nor power, nothing assures that, that, uh, that uh, lasting peace and overcoming suffering. Nothing. So through those things I will get happiness. No. It, life is meant to learn that lesson. Then we turn inwards. Or if you are a devotee, you turn to God. Same thing. The devotee will find that deepest peace and ha happiness 
with his beloved lord and the uh, the gyani finds it in the atman the same thing actually the approach is different so yada tada it's, it's something worth thinking and it is not really all that difficult we think it's very difficult i'll tell you a, a deeper vedantic secret because why does it seem difficult to us because when we think about it i have got these desires giving it up oh it seems very difficult from inside i i may think i'll give it up it will come back tomorrow again what do you give up these are little things that monks in the himalayas they discuss subtle insights what can be given up what can be given up can you give yourself up whatever you think of yourself you yourself can you give it up no the self cannot be given up the other which is not related to you at all can you give that up the swami i donate to you the central park <laughs> no relation to you at all I won the Powerball lottery last night in my dream. All the money I donate to Vedanta Society <laughs> doesn't exist at all. You have no relation with you. So that which is the other, a person, a thing, an object, whatever, that you cannot give up, which has no relation to you, then what can you give up? You cannot give up the self, the Atman. You cannot give up the Anatma, the non, the non-self, the not self. Here is the thing: what you can give up. is that that part of the not self which you have appropriated to yourself and they say in uttarakhand in the himalayas they are very um, direct which you have dishonestly stolen from the world you say it is mine what is yours this body forget all the wealth they all it all comes and goes people wealth places they all come and go gadgets cars possessions all come and go this body itself is this body yours of course you will feel it's body is mine what are you saying show me the papers <laughs> if you are pulled over by the police papers to your body i don't know <laughs> who gave it to you show me the gift deed no it does it say who gave it to you do you own the material sort of the which the body was made and one kind of ownership is i i own the land so that uh, buildings on that i have some kind of claim to it do i own the materials the sky the earth the fire the water no they are god's creation did you make this body no not at all are you maintaining this body yes sort of not really we have very little command over this body and thank god if you suddenly given charge all right you take over now you drive yeah. the endocrine system the digestive system the circulatory system in 2 minutes would be having a cardiac arrest 911 call <laughs> what he tried to run his own show <laughs> we have no capacity whatsoever even the voluntary th- think about it subtly even the voluntary things as simple as raising this hand i did it no i didn't a vague desire came i should raise the hand from where it bubbled up if you watch the mind carefully you did not generate the desire it bubbled up in a seed form from somewhere and shines in the mind then the i thought in the mind yogis can see this very clearly in it's like freeze frame you can see step by step happening a thought bubbles up from the mind deep inside there is an ego functioning in the mind that's also function of the mind i i i whatever happens in the mind i thought comes up raise the hand i will raise the hand this is the thought and then magically the hand raises what did i do in between nothing i did not generate that desire i did not execute that desire did not just think about it what happened in between a, bi- a doctor will tell you a biologist will tell you an enormously complex chain of events happened we don't even know about it let alone doing it the tiniest of things breathing so at least breathing is conscious no it is not we cannot we, if you are actually how the muscles operate here we don't know really so the body we don't operate the body also how do you think it's your body does the body obey you no no 
Right now, if I think, I'll raise the hand, yes. A stroke, right side of the brain, paralyzed. I'll raise my hand, can't. Won't obey you. And good that it does not. It, it has its own wisdom. So, the body does not obey us at all. Even the conscious actions which we think we are doing, if you think deeply inside, we know almost nothing about it. Gita will say later on, Prakrityeva karmani kriyamanani sarvasha. All action in this universe is done by nature. Even what you think you are doing consciously is actually executed by nature. It's literally true. No scientist would dispute that. Then the next line is in the 13th chapter. Ya pashyati tathatmanam akartaram sapashyati. One who realizes this sees that the self is the non-doer. The self really does not do anything. So even the body is not mine. I don't own it. I nobody has given it to me. It does not belong to me. It does not obey me. It does not come and go at my request. I did not sign up for it. Then, what do I own in this world? So whatever I think is mine is because of culture, law, civilization and the way we are conditioned, we think this is mine, this is not mine. Good. As far as transaction is, is there, it's required. You don't have to be crazy about it. But know that it's a fiction. Really, on the ground, we don't own anything here. What we have falsely appropriated to ourselves, that only can be given up. When you look at it this way, your first feeling is, it should be given up. Given up means mentally given up, in your thoughts. I do not lay claim to it anymore. Externally things will continue. You will continue, don't worry, you will still have your car, your house and your children, everything will be there. You can't stop it even if you wanted to. But internally realize, none of them are mine, nor I belong to them. There's only one reality shining forth as all of this. So, yada tada, this is how you give up. When you think in that way, that internal giving up, it's almost an accomplished fact. You should think about it deeply before you realize you have given up the entire universe. That grasping, many people don't know. When you grasp something, I think I'm holding on to it. It's my book, I'm holding on to it. But then I'm stuck here too. Where am I stuck? I'm stuck to this book. Wherever it goes, it will pull me along. <laughs> Hold on to something in the world, that holds, holds on to you. The story of the bear, which was flow, you know, in the flood tide, and the villagers were watching. They saw the nice looking rug being swept away in the flood. And a man said, why should a nice rug go to waste? He jumps in and swims powerfully up to that and gets hold of the rug. When he gets there, he sees it's a bear being swept away. So what do bears do? They'll give you a bear hug. So the bear found this person and caught hold of him. Now in from the distance, people are shouting, let go of the rug, you will drown. Let, let go of it. He's being swept away. They think it's a rug. And the man shouts from there, I have let go of the rug, the rug doesn't let go of me. <laughs> the rug has caught me now. That's the story of all addictions. That's the story of all addictions. Prajahati yada kama. You let go of all desires. It's worth thinking about. Yes, you have a question. Uh, Swamiji, it's quite interesting um, how this is related to verse 47. In verse 47, um, it is Karmani Yuga Adhikara states like you have uh. do the work, drop the desire for fruit. Yeah. Here it is um, drop the desire. Uh, but as Swami Vivekananda says, you still have to do the karma yoga. Yeah. So, um, you know, for people who are still on this journey, who are still not established, there's always this danger that too much dropping the desire might also lead to inaction. No, it will not. All the action will be spiritual action. You'll be engaged in meditation, in, in devotion, in uh, Vedanta, in, in service, and also worldly action, whatever you are doing. Now you, but that worldly action will definitely be streamlined. You have to have a job. You have to feed yourself and your family. Arjun has to fight the war. That's his duty. Now that is now done as a worship of God. Your job. But the extra things that we add on to it, thinking that by this I will get satisfaction. Those things become immaterial very soon. The formula becomes 
the formula becomes neither seek nor avoid. Neither seek nor avoid. Swami Vivekananda gave this formula. As far as work is concerned, neither seek nor avoid. A spiritual seeker. A slacker is a person who keeps avoiding. A worldly person is who, keep, who keeps seeking, adding. I'm lonely, I want to get on 10 committees. <laughs> so that, that kind of thing uh, is worldliness. But whatever comes to your plate, you deal with it. Neither seek nor avoid. It will not lead to inaction. Misunderstanding can lead to inaction. Yeah. And don't worry, that giving up desires like this will not come so fast. <laughs> if you look at it, you'll see. But it shows you. And this is very important. Sarvan means all desires. Sri Ramakrishna gives the example of the farmer. You know, in, uh, in rice fields, they fill water. And the crop has to stay uh, partly under water for some time. So you have to fill the field with water. You have to bring water from the canal into your field. So a farmer worked mightily to bring water into the field and he let the water started filling up. But later on when he came, he saw the field was completely dry. What happened? On the other side of the, the embankment, there was a hole. And all the water which he got in went out from that. So that's also a thing. If we we'll, we'll leave little bits of indulgences here and there. Remember, don't fight with them straight away. First try to find that deep satisfaction, joy or peace in God or Atman. Their bhakti is very useful. It replaces worldly pleasures with the joy of the divine. Without finding a source of happiness, if I try to give up what seems to be clearly to be a source of happiness, then there will be a struggle. If it seems to be a source of happiness to me, automatically what will, I, what will happen? I want it. And now I've read the Gita, I don't want it. And so, <laughs> therapist <laughs> required. <laughs> Conflict. And so be careful about that. Don't force it. But know intelligently, this is, a, this is a central truth. These vasanas, these desires in the mind, they are like the wind which disturbs the mind. The Atman is perfect. The Vedantic knowledge is perfect. The mirror is there. But if it keeps flickering, you will feel my enlightenment is not yet quite, quite there. For that, this has to be gotten rid of. And it's logical. As you say, somebody said about karma, you said about karma yoga. You see, it's all in one line. Jnana yoga, karma yoga, characteristics of an enlightened person. If you probe deeply, they are basically saying one thing only. Some people say, oh, then I have to give up. All right, I have uh, given up X, Y, Z. No, don't start like that. You're starting at the wrong end. Try to find that reality. And let go of all distractions. And it's a process. If you try to let go first, it will be a mighty struggle. And it will lead to uh, complexes, frustrations, unhappiness. If you try to find that, and you then don't let go of worldly things, then you won't find it. Or even if you find it, it will seem elusive and keep going out of your grasp. Because that worldly things are disturbing you. Both should go to hand in hand for a long time. Let me let the world not disturb me and let me try to hold on to God. That uh, Otherwise, the story of the three drunkards who got on a boat and they decided to row across the river to their home at night and they rowed all night. In the morning they found they were exactly there. They had forgotten to remove the anchor. <laughs> so this is the anchor. At one time, the mind will and understanding will become so subtle, you can actually drop the desire. Just let it go. It goes away. When it goes away, it's magical. Just one day it's there, next day not there. And you would think, what possessed me? Why did I waste years of my life hankering for these things? Just gone. And it leaves behind illumination, peace, a deep steadiness, a holiness. Yes. Last uh, question. Does, does there ever come a time when the desire doesn't even come up in the mind? Yes, yes, certainly. There will come a time when the mind is completely undisturbed. You have experienced it. The desire for lollipops you loved as a kindergarten kid it doesn't even come up, doesn't bother you. If it's there in front of you, you wouldn't even want it. You wouldn't even want it. You have gone beyond that. You have transcended it. I loved Superman, Batman comics when I was a kid. But in India they were expensive. So when I went to Hollywood first, I always go to the nearest library. So the Hollywood Boulevard library, what struck me was 
Suddenly I realized in the kids section, all the comics I would have wanted ever in my life, they're all there. And so you can take them. I said, good, I'll catch up on 30 years of Superman and Batman. <laughs> then I took one volume. But it's interesting. I really thought I was going to enjoy it. I took one volume, a big thick volume. I would have been, when I was 10 years old, I would have been delighted at it. I took it back to the monastery and put it on my shelf and stayed there for one and a half months or two months nearly. I couldn't finish a single comic book out of the entire collection. Why? It's not that it disgusted me or anything like that. There's no meaning to me anymore. In a way it's sad. I can't enjoy with Superman anymore. <laughs> but, but the thing is, it's, it's sort of pointless now. So the same thing will happen. It's not that life will become bland. Life becomes much more interesting. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu